One of the great research strengths of special collections and archives is our vast collection of over 9,000 pamphlets and tracts. And I've only been here four weeks, so I haven't had a chance to look at all of them yet. They were collected in the main by three generations of the Bowdler family and came to Lampeter in the early 19th century. I think maybe for people who haven't actually come across them, the words pamphlets and tracts might sound a little dry, but as I'm sure many of you here tonight already know, this is absolutely not the case. And we're going to be hearing shortly about some of the fascinating and broad subjects covered in the pamphlets. And what I find extraordinary is how many of, of the topics resonate with us today. We share so many similar issues and concerns with our forebears. We are very lucky indeed to have Professor Nick Seeger of Keele University with us this evening to talk about this collection and its importance. Nick is head of the School of Humanities at Keele and his research interests are around restoration and 18th century literature, particularly the intersections between literature and history, religion, politics and philosophy. And I think it's safe to say that Nick is the go to academic for anything to do with Daniel Defoe. He's currently editing Defoe's letters for a new publication. He has a vast list of publications and research to his name, and we are so grateful that he has found the time to prepare this talk for us. I'll just mention quickly that we are hoping to have some time at the end for some questions. So if you do have a question, if you can pop it into chat, we'll see how many we can get through. But now I will stop talking and vanish from your screens and hand you over to Nick. So Nick, please take it away. Well, thank you so much and thank you to um, all colleagues at the university for um, the invitation as well as for facilitating um, this talk and thanks to everyone else for coming to the talk. My intention is to introduce one of the many treasures of the um, Roderick Bowen Research Centre at the University of Wales Trinity St David in Lampeter, which is the Boulder Tracks as um, has been mentioned. This is a major collection of pamphlets spanning from the 16th century to the 19th, and it is truly unique. Um, I've spent less than four weeks looking at it, and I can only um, say that I can, um, can't, can't really do full justice to it in any way, shape or form, but I'll try to give some um, indications of the kinds of topics that are covered and um, relate this to um, broader questions about politics, religion and culture in the late 17th and early 18th centuries. So the talk this evening is in three parts. First, I'm going to, in general terms, describe the culture of pamphlets in late Stuart England, what pamphlets were, the kinds of cultural importance they had, their relationships to other forms of information and other forms of literature, how they were produced, consumed and collected. Then in the second section, I'll turn to my um, my pet interest really, um, the turbulent pamphleting, pamphleteering career of Daniel Defoe, a man whose life almost exactly overlapped with Thomas Bowdler II, the collector who built most of the collection in Lampeter, though the two men, Defoe and Bowdler, politically speaking, were chalk and cheese. Then finally, I want to describe the um, scope and nature of the collection at Lampeter in particular. What about it is unique? What makes it distinctive? Um, its value to literary scholars and historians, why people should go to Lampeter and have a look, and I'll pick out a few curious examples. So printed pamphlets were rife in late 17th and early 18th century Britain, but they remain a largely underutilised resource for historians and literary scholars, which is to say that Lots of people draw on them, but we don't really have many studies of um, pamphlets as a genre that really focus on the form. They tend to be a resource for other kinds of interests. They've certainly attracted less attention from scholars than two other genres that arose at a similar time, the newspaper and the novel. Indeed, their influence on those genres and other genres, including poetry and drama, remains unappreciated. Given the generic and topical plurality of pamphlets, the fact that they take multiple forms and address a panoply of issues, it's quite difficult to sustain any hard and fast distinction between pamphlets and newspapers, novels, poems, plays. Pamphlets are usually in prose and usually one-off publications, but some were serials, just as some periodical topical works were like pamphlets in their organisation. 
Pamphlets were as often in verse as in prose. They frequently used dialogue and they frequently fictionalized situations such as by employing allegory or giving a behind the scenes imaginary reconstruction of goings on in the corridors of power. For the most part, they were ephemeral, tomorrow's fish wrap, but in some cases they've endured and been considered as literature or have been recognized for their historical significance. Some achieved mammoth sales like the one depicted on the screen, Jonathan Swift's The Conduct of the Allies. Their survival is quite diffuse and patchy, but in one case, close to our interests tonight, they were collected over several generations and survive in that collection. So take a look at this title page. It's quite typical in certain ways. Um, you can see it's quite a, a lengthy title, The Conduct of the Allies and of the Late Ministry in Beginning and Carrying On the Present War, uh, 1711. It's a very important pamphlet. Um, in some respects, it's credited with shifting the national mood towards um, peace during the War of the Spanish Succession. Um, Swift, being a great writer, was able to really um, persuade the nation of the need to end the war soon, which is what um, happened in due course. Bibliographically, um, you can imagine the kinds of impact that it would have on a typographical level. You can see the kinds of visual semantics of the typography, the capitals, the italics, the black letter type. Um, type size plays a part in this as well. And um, from the, the title itself, you can kind of hear the sort of tone of it, the conduct of the Allies and of the late ministry. It's a pamphlet that blames. It blames the Allies, particularly the Dutch, and it blames the late ministry, the Whigs, who um, in Swift's account had so badly mismanaged the war. One thing to say, of course, is that there's no declaration of who the author is. That's very common. There is, um, I'm wondering if it's blocked out by uh, my image in the top right corner, but trust me if you can't see it, there is a, a, at the top in the middle um, a penciled um, note that to say Swift, to you know, a curator's note to identify um, the author. Um, you can see that this is the fifth edition corrected um, from the title page there. There's a Latin quotation from Lucan. Um, so, so it's just giving you a sense of um, the way that this, this didn't just come out, but it came out a lot. It, it came out sold out. It came out sold out again and again and again. And, and that's not uncommon for these pamphlets, although they often aren't reprinted down the years, that they, they came out in multiple um, editions or, or at least um, multiple issues um, at the time they were published. So in Swiss Day, um, pamphlets had been around for ages. I'm not trying to say that um, the early 18th century is the birth of this form. Um, there were important printed pamphlets in the late 16th and the early 17th century, such as the famous uh, Martin Marpre late tracts of 1588 to 9, which attacked the episcopacy of the Anglican Church. Of course, in the literary hierarchy throughout the 16th and 17th centuries and into the 18th, really, um, pamphlets were rank rated quite low, seen as something bashed out by anyone, requiring no real depth of understanding or learning. The first real boom in pamphleteering, to my mind, in both England and Scotland, when we can start to think about um, something approaching a mass readership, was a product of the relaxed censorship laws and an explosion of divergent views about politics and religion during the English civil wars and their aftermath in the 1640s. Attempts at legislation during the 1650s didn't curtail the kinds of explosion of print and in his 1644 pamphlet calling for freedom from censorship and for liberty of printing and by association, liberty of conscience and of opinion, John Milton spoke to a rising sense that pamphlets had value for those who knew how to read them. A wise man, he says, will make better use of an idle pamphlet than a fool will do of sacred scripture. The pamphlets were the product of a Britain moving away from uniformity and conformity in church and state. There were things to be debated in all kinds of ways. Um, the cat certainly didn't go back into the bag after the restoration of the monarchy, of the Church of England and of print licensing after 1660. The fractious religious settlement achieved at the restoration 
competition between the church established and uh, religious dissent, tussles between parliament and the crown over the conduct of foreign affairs, war, trade, co colonies, and political disputes between groups that came by the late 1670s to be called respectively Whigs and Tories, all contributed to this kind of turbulence. This ensured a steady flow of pamphlets from the ever increasing numbers of London and Edinburgh printing presses, as well as increasing consumption and production in provincial towns, with a population that was increasingly hungry for news and opinion and able to purchase and read cheap print. In short, whereas in the late um, 16th century, it would have been incredibly unusual, hence very risky to debate political affairs in a pamphlet, by the 1680s, this was standard. The rise of pamphleteering then, to, to generalise, and I should say these are not uncontested concepts, they're things that need to be debated as well as particularised, so I'm giving a bit of a, a broad brushstroke kind of idea of this. Uh, the rise of pamphleteering is linked to a democratisation of politics, which is to say that, relatively speaking, more ordinary folk were sufficiently literate, enfranchised and interested to want to be abreast of political goings on during the reigns of Charles II, James II, William and Mary, Queen Anne, and on into the Georgian period. The rise of the pamphlet is also a sign of the familiar to us politicisation of everything. These publications took positions on questions of religion, trade, finance, morality, medicine, public health, war, diplomacy, colonialism, literature, theatre and everything else. But politics, local, national, international, in abstract theory and in practical reality, was really key to the pamphlet. The 17th century was an age of great political thought in Britain. Thomas Hobbes, Robert Filmer, John Locke, Mary Astle, and James Harrington were among those who debated the origins and nature of government, which seemed utterly up for grabs, tugged between relatively religious and secular positions and between classical and modern models. The pamphlets are inevitably more topical than works like Hobbes's Leviathan or Locke's treatises on government, but they use those immediate issues to reflect on the substratal political ideologies that inform their take on current affairs. And there was no shortage of hot topics. In 1679, the issue was the proposed exclusion from the monarchical succession of Charles II's Catholic brother, James Duke of York pamphleteers went to war on this issue and it largely gave rise or at least consolidated to some extent um, political groupings that would come to be known as parties. Following James's succession and then his deposition or his abdication depending on your point of view, in 1688 there was an intense allegiance controversy staged in the press as English men and women tried to figure out what the revolution had meant. At this time, by the way, our pamphlet collector, Thomas Bowdler, refused the new oaths of allegiance to William and Mary and an oath of abjuration of King James and resigned his naval post. He retired and um, started uh, to ramp up his collection. By 1701, in the wake of the death of Princess Anne's last surviving child, the Duke of Gloucester, there was another succession crisis, again keenly debated. After Queen Anne's own accession, in 1704 to 5, the pamphleteers debated the security of the Church of England, culminating with the major controversy around one pamphlet, the title page depicted here, the Memorial of the Church of England. The prosecution of the clergyman, Henry Sacheverell, in 1709 to 10, also provoked a storm of pamphlets and similarly was a referendum on the 1688 revolution, questions of toleration and the establishment of the Anglican Church. Pamphlets coming out of Edinburgh and London were crucial in presenting competing viewpoints of the 1707 Anglo-Scottish Union. This was also an age replete with general elections. Ten were held between 1694 and 1715, and we thought we had it bad. And rival Tory and Whig authors went to battle, such as in 1710 and 1713 campaigns, the hot topic of the latter being the Tory negotiated peace with France and trade. Um, after Anne's death in 1715, pamphlets tried to unpick the turbulent events of her reign and to grapple with the question 
of whether Britain would embrace the Hanoverian elector, crowned George I, or welcome back a Stuart claimant, dubbed the Jacobite pretender, who led an uprising in 1715. This is a very skeletal outline of the pressing public debates of later Stuart England, a time when England went from the last stages of monarchical absolutism to something like a more representative parliamentary democracy defined by a two-party political system. In the process, it went from a bit part player in European affairs to a, a major power on its way to becoming a global superpower and empire by the mid 18th century. The pamphlets of the period document this, showing how fractious was Britain's rise. If we want to understand how this rise of pamphleteering came about, we also need to look beyond political history, or at least to put it into conversation with the history of print and of the book. Following the Restoration, a Licensing Act was passed in 1662, which sought to clamp down on the press and agents of censorship, most prominently licensor of, licensor of the press, Roger Lestrange, railed against pamphlets as both the products and instigators of sedition, harking back to the supposed free-for-all of the Civil War years. Such was the fear of the power of printed sedition that, that Lestrange wrote books in complete opposition to Milton's position, such as considerations and proposals in order to the regulation of the press, together with diverse instances of treasonous and seditious pamphlets, proving the necessity thereof, published in 1662. Lestrange stoked the moral panic that kept him in employment, such as by writing, "'Tis none of the worst ways of address to the genius and humour of the common people, whose affections are much more capable of being tuned and wrought upon by convenient hints and touches in the shape and air of a pamphlet than by the strongest reasons and best notions imaginable under any other and more sober form whatsoever. Here, the musical metaphor casts the common people as manipulable, as playable, and suggests that pamphlets are not only distributed clandestinely, but have a power subliminally to direct ordinary readers away from sobriety, reason and loyalty. The reality was that pamphlets, as Lestrange well knew, were as much the agents as the subverters of the state. Many welcomed Charles II back, celebrated monarchy and advocated the policies of the crown and its ministries. But the government's interest was largely in suppression or at least pre-publication scrutiny, licensing, which drove production underground and brought about strategies of indirection like allegory and satire, which shaped literary history as well as political debate. Only in 1679, when it temporarily lapsed, and then in 1695, um, after the revolution, was licensing altogether abandoned. In that year, 1695, the Secretary of State, Sir William Trumbull, wrote that since the act for printing expired, London swarms with seditious pamphlets. The end to licensing was less about press freedom, Milton's ideal, and more about a shift in efficacious press control. The government came to rely on post-publication laws of sedition, libel and treason, rather than unwieldy and by and large ineffective, ineffective preventatives. The Copyright Act of 1710 in some respects gave authors and publishers greater legal protections, property in their writings, but it also solidified their legal responsibility and accountability for what they'd written or published. Taxation was another form of control. The Stamp Act 1712 imposed new levies on pamphlets, but especially on periodicals. So I've given so far the political background and legal framework to some of this material, but what do we know about how pamphlets were produced and read? One thing to tussle with, as I've already gestured towards, is the vast prevalence of anonymity or pseudonymity. Very few pamphlets announce their actual authorship. The value of the form was a kind of cloak and dag dagger singular stab and authors therefore had good reasons for veiling their identities, just as they sometimes had good reasons for revealing it, either explicitly or obliquely, 
on title pages or within the book or later after the fact. So anonymity and pseudonymity are kind of part of the um, package here and it's worth thinking about the difference between pamphlets and periodical forms like newspapers as well as um, sort of opinion piece um, uh, periodicals like Defoe's Review or Swift's Examiner because um, to set up that kind of enterprise of course you need a much bigger establishment than bashing out a pamphlet and although it has the advantages of cultivating a kind of um, a persona, a sense of trust and of um, recursion to given political themes and topics, which some of those um, periodical authors um, do very well. At the same time, it, it's, it's quite um, difficult to maintain anonymity. It's quite difficult to um, evade um, uh, the agents of the law. Pamphlets have a much greater facility um, in that respect. Obviously, there are financial as well as ideological motives for authors. Producing pamphlets could be a quick job for an immediate payment. For printers and publishers, they were a comparatively cheap and easy job, which could be done between longer, more financially risky ones. After they were printed, um, pamphlets were hawked on the street, they were sold in bookseller shops, and they were bought up by establishments such as the coffee houses that were cropping up all over London in the Restoration and in provincial towns too. Gentlemen, and they mostly were men, could read the pamphlets and other daily papers in these establishments. So then as now, Brits um, enjoyed overpriced coffee and political gossip. Um, and I think all of this provides a good example of how social changes, the kinds of spaces and um, sociable contexts in which individuals interacted, had an impact on the production of knowledge because these coffee houses um, and pamphlets together provided in tandem a forum for habitual ongoing conversations about news and politics um, experienced almost solely through print. Not always seen as positive developments. In a 1711 pamphlet called The Conference or Greg's Ghost Set in the Afterlife, the devil asks one newly arrived soul how wars between political parties are carried on back in the land of the living. What sort of weapons do they use? He asks. Pamphlets, sir. You may go into a coffee house and see a table of half an acre's length covered with nothing but tobacco pipes and pamphlets and all the seats full of mortals leaning on their elbows, licking in tobacco, lies and laced coffee and studying for arguments to revile one another with. In this description, we have a notion of distraction. Consuming pamphlets is a diversion from real business, energy wasted and intellects wasting. We have this sense of um, plenitude, of excess, this absurdly elongated table with a news cycle that can never be mastered. We have this, these ideas about, um, about a society divided politically in terms of opinion and of confirmation bias and vituperation, um, of impoliteness, of people wanting to be at each other's throats and in um, hostile relations. But above all, I think we have here an image of intoxication, not an enlightened, informed um, populace, but a drugged citizenry sucking in the lives of these unscrupulous pamphleteers as hungrily as they do tobacco and coffee, which at this time were distrusted foreign imports that um, addled their consumers, probably still are. The picture here, the image itself, is of a London um, coffee house in about 1700, and it shows a rather more convivial, sociable, orderly and rational scene. So there are clearly two sides to the coin. Pamphlets also came in a range of sizes and shapes, but the relatively small octavo form was most common. They took, as I've said, very different generic forms, including um, the prose essay, which is most common and is somewhat implied by the word tract, but also poetry, drama or dialogue, transcriptions of sermons or speeches or other kinds of oral performances, or letters or other kinds of manuscript forms as well. Some uh, pamphlets really cultivate this relationship to performance, to oratory or to manuscript. And so I think they're very interested to scholars who are interested in these kinds of intersections of different forms of communication. 
And we should, of course, recognise that reading aloud and communally was common. And also we should recognise, although it's not really the focus of my talk today, that manuscript circulation of pamphlets was still um, going on. Let's segue into the second part of the lecture, uh, which is about Defoe as a pamphleteer. And let's just focus briefly on epistolary pamphlets, ones that purport to be letters. Defoe wrote uh, pamphlets that um, simulated um, correspondence to uh, particular individuals, such as um, a letter to Mr. Howe. And from the long title of that, you can probably tell that this is a reply to a Howe pamphlet, which replied to a Defoe pamphlet. Um, Defoe wrote an inquiry into the occasional conformity of dissenters. Howe wrote um, considerations of the preface, dot, 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 and um, in turn, Defoe wrote a reply. So there's a kind of dialogue, um, dialogic kind of nature to the um, publication um, of these things as well. Um, he also wrote uh, group, um, letters to groups, such as this one um, to the dissenters. In fact, he wrote several pamphlets, confusingly, with the title A Letter to the Dissenters. And these operate a bit like open letters um, that kind of um, call out a group and, and, and hold it to account in some ways. But there are also outright fabrications, like um, the third one along here, um, which is supposedly written by a member of the House of Commons on a recent contentious vote in the House. And the one on the end there, on the right hand side, um, entitled A Friendly Epistle by Way of Reproof to Thomas Bradbury, which is part of a series of um, addresses in the form of letters to particular individuals that Defoe wrote in the voice of a Quaker taking advantage of the supposed plain speaking associated with the Quakers to lambast his political opponents. So Defoe, as you will know, is best known nowadays for his works of fiction. Um, he wrote um, novels including uh, Robinson Crusoe, Mole Flanders and A Journal of the Plague Year. But by far the majority of the works that Defoe wrote, and he wrote a lot, something like 300, were um, examples of topical political commentary, including periodicals and pamphlets. In 1703, Defoe published a collection of his pamphlets, so you can see that he was clearly very proud of these things, um, including works both in prose and verse called A True Collection of the Writings of the Author of the True Born Englishman. He signed his actual name to very few of the pamphlets he is now credited with having written, but his favourite soubriquet was the author of The True Born Englishman, cashing in on the phenomenal success of his 1701 poem of that title, a work that brought him um, to mass attention as a commentator on public affairs. In this period, as I'm sure you know, poetry had a very public function, often commenting directly on topical affairs. The true-born Englishman was a defence of the Dutch-born King William III against the xenophobic attacks of some of his British subjects. In response, Defoe's poem shows that notions of national purity are mythical and quickly crumble when scrutinised historically. Here's a sample from the poem. Thus from a mixture of all kinds began that heterogeneous thing, an Englishman. In eager rapes and furious lust begot betwixt a painted Briton and a Scot, whose gendering offspring quickly learned to bow and yoke their heifers to the Roman plough, from whence a mongrel half-bred race there came, with neither name nor nation, speech nor fame, in whose hot veins new mixtures quickly ran, infused betwixt a Saxon and a Dane, while their rank daughters to their parents just received all nations with promiscuous lust. This nauseous brood directly did contain the well-extracted blood of Englishmen. So it's quite um, far removed from, um, you know, um, Britons never shall be slaves and so on. Um, and it shows that kind of deep questions about history and national identity were fair game for, for pamphleteers. The English, Defoe is saying, have long been a mongrel race, a hodgepodge of indigenous Roman, Saxon, Scandinavian, Norman and much else. As one couplet of the poem declares, a true born Englishman's a contradiction in speech and irony, in fact, a fiction. 
And you can only imagine how this went down, especially when Defoe uses this kind of sexualized language of promiscuity, the lust of ranked daughters ripe for conquest with serial foreign invasion, imagined as invited rapes, and the language of servility, the nauseous brood who quickly adapt to new masters each time they're conquered. The poem made Defoe notorious. In his early career, this kind of um, high point, uh, really, Defoe was clearly not afraid of shocking the sensibilities of his readers. He set himself up as a writer who pulled no punches and told disconcerting truths, and the pamphlet, verse, prose, was the form in which he did it. This led him to trouble. Early in the following reign, after the Anglican Queen Anne succeeded William and appointed Tory ministers eager to shore up the security of the Church of England, Defoe took a step too far. In 1702, Defoe, who was a dissenter himself, wrote The Shortest Way with the Dissenters, a book published like most of his works anonymously. There's no author name on the title page, and in fact, um, the pose is that of an Anglican clergyman. The shortest way appears to argue that the toleration of religious separatists, of Protestant nonconformists, has gone too far, that uniformity in church and state was the only way to uphold civil, civil society. Banishment for nonconformists and execution of their pastors was the kindest way of dealing with religious error. This is where the satire bites. Compassion depends on cruelty. The shortest way with the dissenters was a hoax. It mimicked high church rhetoric in order to expose it. Defoe was calling out intolerant Anglicans and doing so by caricaturing rabid high church intolerance. Here is a very typical passage. It is vain to trifle in this matter. The light foolish handling of them by malts, fines, etc. tis their glory and their advantage. If the gallows instead of the counter and the galleys instead of the fines were the reward of going to a conventicle, a dissenting meeting house, to preach or hear, there would not be so many sufferers. The spirit of martyrdom is over. They that will go to church to be chosen sheriffs and mayors would go to 40 churches rather than be hanged. Defoe's problem was that the impersonation was too good. What was supposed to sound outlandish sounded authentic. The dissenters were terrified that such measures, galleys or gallows, might be implemented, and churchmen set about endorsing what they had read, assuming that one of their own had written this and meant every word. When it emerged that the shortest way was written by a notorious nonconformist, the dissenters were annoyed that their worst fears had been articulated by one of their own, and the high churchmen shocked to learn that they had concurred with a nonconformist pastiche of their views. Worse still, the government decided that the work was seditious and set about hunting for the author. Defoe was eventually um, arrested after five months on the run. He was um, tried condemned, um, sentenced to um, a heavy fine and basically financially ruined. He was um, pilloried on three occasions, um, so made to stand in the stocks. And um, he was then imprisoned until he could find um, sufficient sureties for his good behaviour. It all spelled financial ruin and, and disaster, really, and it, it could have been the end of him. But instead, in some ways, it was the making of him uh, because Defoe was... Um, saved from prison by the very government that had um, prosecuted him, which saw the chance to engage him as a propagandist. It was the then Secretary of State, Robert Harley, who brokered Defoe's release from Nougat and engaged him as a ministerial writer. For the next decade, Defoe produced pamphlets and periodicals in support of the government. Correspondence between Defoe and Harley shows how they collaborated on propaganda campaigns throughout much of Queen Anne's reign. The partnership attracted a lot of hostility. When Harley fell from office in 1708, one pamphlet that dubbed Harley the Welsh monster and pointed out the cosy relationship of the politician and the press agent um, wrote that um, Bob and Dan were linked in friendship and as great as great pals as cup and can. So um, Defoe's 
pamphlet hearing career is quite instructive. There's 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 a lot going on. Um, I've I've touched on the true born Englishman in the shortest way with the dissenters, but there are there are so many more um, examples of how he got into um, scrapes and um, ran afoul of different people. That it's all very um, instructive and interesting. In some ways, very typical. In certain ways, uh, very atypical. But it could be useful rather than to hear more examples of what he wrote on any given issue. Um, to think a little bit how, about what we know of how he went about disseminating pamphlets, or at least one of his pamphlets. The pamphlet here, the title page is on the left, is called Remarks on the Letter to the Author of the State Memorial, published in 1706. And again, it's just worth thinking about how, what kinds of um, assumptions of knowledge are embedded in that, the kinds of ways in which you sort of have to know the precedents and have to know the debates before you can have um, a point of access to a, to a piece like this. Um, so, so to give you an idea, this pamphlet is, get ready, a reply to a reply to a reply to a 1705 pamphlet, the Memorial of the Church of England, which had alleged that the Church of England was imperiled under the current, current government. On the right hand side is Defoe's handwritten list of distribution agents all over Britain and Ireland in which he specifies how his remarks were sent into the country. That's the, the language at the top, sent into the country. 100 go to Plymouth and Biddeford at the top, distributed there by Mr Barron, a minister. 100 to Exeter for Mr Evely, ditto, also a minister. And you can see as you kind of go down there that Manchester, Leeds, Newcastle um, appear at the bottom of the first column before it cuts off on my PowerPoint. Uh, the second column, if my face isn't in the way, you can see um, goes from East Anglia at the top down to Sherborne in Dublin at the bottom. And the document, which was prepared um, for Harley and is preserved in the British Library, indicates that over 2,000 copies of this pamphlet were disseminated nationally. Note that 50 were laid down in coffee houses and 100 given about by hand. So it's a, a quite rare surviving record of how uh, one pamphlet, not a very remarkable or memorable pamphlet, gained such an extensive reach, showing the vast um, reach of news beyond the metropolis by the early 18th century. For his efforts, Defoe was predictably vilified as one who stoked up political passions and animosities through his writings. So um, modern age attacks on journalists are, are nothing new. One such assault, a poem called Jure Divino Tossed in a Blanket from 1707, um, is uh, uh, is quoted from here. And just to explain, uh, Joy Divino was um, a, a poem, a long epic poem really that Defoe wrote, um, but which was also pirated. And it's the piracy that appears on the right hand side, depicting not Defoe um, in any kind of um, gentlemanly way as he presented himself, but rather harking back to his pillorying um, of a few years earlier. And this pamphlet um, attack on Defoe characterizes Britain as an unhappy isle where faction always reigns and seems supported in it by providence. Satire and scandal, ammunition are, and pen and ink declare a paper war, where scribblers, like our Daniel, fear a peace who draw their whole subsistence from the press. Print is their standard, publishes their drums, feud is the word, and pamphlets are their guns. I love that phrase, pamphlets are their guns. So you can hear that Britons felt they were living in a divided, divided society and that the press was exacerbating things. In the final part of this talk, having given a bit of a kind of general overview of pamphleteering culture and a bit of a, an intense focus on Defoe, I want to turn to the Bowdler collection in particular. As um, has already been mentioned by Sean, um, it um, comprises around 9,500 tracts, um, and these are bound in 810 volumes. Pamphlets, by the nature of their contents, their use and their formats, are very much perishable things. Even in an age like today, when we have large digital databases of early modern books, such as early English books online and 18th century collections online, we should recognise that we can access the ephemera of the past, 
in libraries or on screens because of the carefulness of collectors and curators. The track collection at Lampeter is truly unique in its extent, um, as well as comprising 9,500 pamphlets. Um, these are bound in 810 volumes um, and 550 of those were, we know, compiled by several generations of the Bowdler family. And most credit goes to Thomas Bowdler II, who was a prolific collector, especially during the reigns of Queen Anne and George I. He inherited his uncle's collection of older works and augmented this by buying up lots at sales. He benefited from the shared interest of his friend and fellow non-juror, the Saxonist scholar George Hicks, who bequeathed him more items. And of course, he purchased pamphlets as they came out. The coverage is especially strong in the last years of Queen Anne's reign, which became notorious across the 18th century as being kind of the high point of party strife. Uh, those fractious years of 1710 to 14, when um, the big kind of topics, um, big topic of debate was um, the nature of the peace with France. You know, the, the Tories went out of power in 1714 and didn't get back in until 1760. So that gives an idea of the, um, the consequences. Perhaps the only um, comparable uh, collection of pamphlets for such a sustained coverage as we get with the Boulder collection is the Thomason tracts in the British Library covering the civil wars and the Commonwealth period. Another great pamphlet collector, broadly contemporaneous with Boldler, was Narcissus Lut uh, Luttrell, um, the politician and diarist, but his collection, unlike Boldler's, was dispersed after his death. Boldler's was inherited and added to by Thomas Boldler III, a banker, and in turn by Dr Thomas Boldler, a physician most famous as the editor or expurgator of Shakespeare's plays who produced the family Shakespeare in the early 19th century. Dr Boldler retired um, to Swansea and he left the track collection to the university in Lampeter. Other bequests um, added to the core provided by the Boldler collection too. In comparison to a collection such as the Thomason Tracts in the British Library, which um, the Thomason Tracts, 22,000 printed items, 2,000 volumes, 7,200 printed news sheets and pamphlets, um, the bolder ones can cover a longer period and have less focus. Rather than being a weakness, this is a real strength of the collection as it does provide a, a representative slice of life for the long period that it covers the range of problems, concerns and topics that actuated people in late Stuart and Georgian Britain. As well as this representative quality of the collection, there's also the fact that it contains a number of items not recorded in any other collection. Scholars familiar, for example, with David Foxon's magisterial catalogue of English verse, 1701 to 1750, published in 1975, will know how full and accurate a reference work that is. But there is a handful of poems in the Boulder collection that escaped Foxon's notice. Beyond its scope, the collection is also fascinating for several other reasons, um, which you really have to get, get to Lampeter and see it in person to appreciate. One of these are the annotations made by Bowdler, which are valuable in assigning authorship, a very fraught business with such a mass of anonymous writings, um, useful for precisely dating items because he tended to stick the date on the, on the cover, and for figuring out cryptic allusions. Because of sedition and libel laws, it was quite common for authors in the early 18th century to blank out proper names, and reconstructing these is sometimes a little bit tricky. Here, for example, are a couple of pages of the Boldler copy of Defoe's 1702 poem, Reformation of Manners, a searing indictment of public figures, politicians, peers, preachers, poets, and justices of the peace, who fall short of the high standards of the puritanical Defoe. You can see that some of the names have been filled in to make sense of the political and personal scandals to which Defoe alludes. So over on the left, we have um, let Dorset drench his wit with his estate and Oxford sin in spite of age and fate on the wrong side of 80, let him whore, he always was and will be lewd and poor. Let Devonshire be proud and Ormond gay lavish of vast estates and scorn to pay and so on and so forth and over on the right hand side we have um, the personal scandal of 
um, Charles Duncombe, a financier and, and justice of the peace, and um, the um, allegations that um, he was keeping prostitutes um, at the same time that he was sending others off to um, Bradwell to be whipped. So you can see it's quite um, scandalous and, um, and ribald and um, irreverent, really. So I've mentioned uh, that, the, that these pamphlets that we're dealing with come in all kinds of genres. Take a look at this one. Uh, it really impresses upon us that readers had to be very wary and, and knowing, and many were. So one interesting item in the Lampeter collection is memoirs relating to the late famous Mr. Thomas Brown with a catalogue of his library, published in 1704. Brown, who died in summer 1704, was a Tory satirist known for a facetious style and a licentious lifestyle, and the memoirs celebrates his, his wit and his life. It also includes, as the title page indicates, a supposed library catalogue, which amounts to nothing more than a lampoon on Whiggish books. This moment, late 1704, was quite a delicate one. Um, the Tory government that dominated the early years of Anne's reign was gradually giving way to a more moderate position, which would soon be more fully Whig. So it was to some degree a kind of um, backlash against um, the changing tides of the parties. Resembling um, something that Private Eye might do today, each fictitious item, I'm just kind of going through the pages, uh, mocks a Whiggish figure and boldly you can see as annotated several to explain the illusion. For example, number 21, the Rangeress, a comedy acted on Windsor Forest, alludes to the Duchess of Marlborough, Queen Anne's groom of the stole and, and um, favourite um, court lady, um, who was a diehard Whig. There are jibes at Defoe, of course, it's hard to find uh, a pamphlet in the period that doesn't um, uh, attack Defoe at the bottom of page 13, um, which alludes to his, uh, ironically alludes to his fair dealing with creditors and his lack of good breeding, which is to say his background in trade. Um, I'll finish this talk on the next page because it contains um, a topical allusion that um, Bowdler helps us with which is quite um, pertinent to the occasion tonight. Number 46, over on the left-hand side, a new tract of simoniacal polity by the late Bishop of St. David's, and um, it's uh, Boulder's filled in the Davids, in four vol folio. Um, in 1699, after a contentious legal case, Thomas Watson appointed to the, uh, um, the bishopric um, by James II was expelled on the charge of simony, which the Tories considered um, largely a trumped up, politically motivated charge. So this is just kind of one of 9,500 or so um, items, some of which are um, fascinating, some of which are not, it's fair to say, um, but to some degree you have to kind of get there to, to, to appreciate the complexities of it. And I think it'd be nice uh, now if we can move into um, discussion, question and answers. And all I'll say by way of conclusion is that these pamphlets disclose a really rich history. They're obviously partisan documents and they need to be approached by historians and literary scholars as such. Um, the collection in Lampeter is pretty much unrivaled outside of the British Library. Um, and I hope that it continues to um, enrich um, literary and historical studies. So thank you again for, for coming tonight and thank you for listening. And if people have observations or questions, that would be um, great for me. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nick, for an absolutely wonderful and informative talk. It's fascinating for me in particular in this new role to, to hear about just a small part of the collection and it certainly made me want to go out to Lampeter and find out more and I'm sure there will be a lot of interest hopefully in the coming weeks and months from people who are here this evening. Now I've noticed some questions coming up in chat and some uh, back and forth and, and discussion so I will see what there is and I will pass on the questions. Uh, oh, there's a lot. Right, so starting with the first one, the question is, what circulation access these? What percentage of the population could read? Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. Um, 
very, very difficult. It, we, we're dealing not just with um, what proportion of the population could read, but also what proportion of the population um, could access um, the materials, not just buying it, but, but also being in the kinds of spaces that could. Um, yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's made very difficult as well by um, how we how we go about measuring literacy um, it's clearly not the, quite the same as um, the evidence that we have which is that of people writing we've also got to remember that um, we do have some anecdotal and kind of isolated um, um, reports of, of people being read too so even if um, you know you, you can imagine um, some people not all but but some people might, might be reading um, this kind of material as well as other kinds of material sermons and, and the like um within families so i don't think i'm qualified to give a, a a very specific answer on what proportion of people could read um but i think there's broad consensus although it's very contested territory there's a big literature on it but broad consensus that by and large it is um rising excellent thank you very much sorry uh, to then... the question really I don't want to give a give a bad answer, give you a, a fact, give you a certain number, and then it, for it to be just plain wrong. I'm sure there are no bad answers in academia. It's widely debated. <laughs> um, another question is, do any of the tracts relate in some way to Wales specifically that you're aware of? I know you haven't had too much of a chance to, to look through all of them. Um, I'm not sure. Um, I don't think so. I think, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think there's, there's anything resembling a Welsh focus, no. Um, it is, dis, despite some production outside of London, still a pretty London-centric um, culture, and that to some degree probably is neglecting Wales. Um, there is um, a good representation of the Anglo-Scottish tracts which surround um, debates kind of going from the 1690s through to um, after the Union. Um, so that's better represented and, and there's far more um, publication um, publishing going on, of course, in Edinburgh. So my sense is not especially. Okay, that's great, thank you. Um, next question is, uh, you have identified a series of flashpoints when pamphlets increased in availability. Does that mean that outside those times they were published very sparingly or there was a multitude of topics that they covered? Um, Yes, it's a good question. I, I think I think that's the way to sit, and it, it's surprising sometimes. The things that you think might be uh, big flashpoints don't really turn out to be big flashpoints. And I don't have a good sense that the Jacobite Rebellion really produced a lot of print because, by and large, most um, people in England agreed um, that you know this this wasn't a great thing, and also overt Jacobitism was 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 very risky. Whereas things that seem incredibly trivial nowadays especially um debates about the security of the church in a in a nation where the church was so dominant both in terms of property and also population um seem to really actuate people so um yeah i, th I think that um there are big issues and there are some really important um bibliographies and reference works that focus on things like the um the popish plot and exclusion crisis in the 70s 1670s and 80s um the allegiance controversy in the um after the after the revolution um the sacheverell crisis the union things like that there are those that just generate so much so so much um and then there's a steady flow around all kinds of other things as well um so yeah i, I think it is quite diffuse beyond those other things um you know um i got quite interested i tried to kind of focus on one topic for example and there were about 40 or so also pamphlets written in 1713 14 on the question of whether uh, resumption of trade with france should should happen um so you know another kind of um issue that seems um relevant to today um but on which it really divided people so it's the it's the things that really divide people squarely i think that, that you get these flashpoints um on but there's a steady trickle and, and, it, and generally speaking an increase across the period um was that all of the question if i missed anything there sean no i think you've got everything that's that's really really interesting um do you know there are so many questions coming in we may have to be here for quite a long time i, I won't keep you too late i promise no no it's fine i'm happy 
This is a good one, and a couple of people have liked this one. Are any pamphlets written by or specifically aimed at women? And I think we can probably widen that to maybe not just the pamphlets here, but just generally speaking, what's your sense for that? Yeah, um, women are writing pamphlets all the way from the Civil War onwards. So um, Anna Trapnell, um, a, 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 a writing um, religious um, materials in the um, in the, in the Civil War, um, there, there were other relatively famous um, writers of um, works that we would call pamphlets, including um, Afra Bain, including uh, Della Rivia Manley, including Eliza Haywood. Um, women are involved in the publishing of pamphlets. Um, Anne Baldwin is a, is a famous publisher of these materials. Um, Elizabeth Appleby um, as well. Um, there certainly are Mm, pamphlets written exclusively for for women. There are certainly ones that are directed at women, but which seem quite, shall I say, satirical. There's um, you know something that comes to my head is um, one called "Good Advice to the Ladies," which is fr quite frankly a, a misogynistic kind of um, piece. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I no, it's in, almost impossible to kind of prove a negative with this sort of thing. But I certainly don't think many are written to women in a way that is not. Um, how do we put how do I put this um, loaded? Um, women were um, patronesses, um, so to speak. Uh, the Duchess of Marlborough um, led a bit of a kind of mini propaganda machine um, with her um, sort of right hand man Arthur Mainwaring um, across Anne's reign, um, sending out lots and lots of Whig propaganda. So there's a lot of um, uh, female presence in in this kind of um, culture. Um, the, the predecessor to the kinds of stuff that I'm focusing on is a book by Joe Raymond called Pamphlets and Pamphleteering in uh, Early Modern England, I think it's called. And he really covers the period up to the exclusion crisis. So he goes from the, the 1550s, 1580s through to um, the 1670s. And he has a chapter on um, women's um, uh, roles in, in pamphlet culture as early as that. So that's only growing as well because female professional author authorship is on the rise um, in this period. Um, there's a good recent book by uh, Rachel Carnell called Backlash, which is about Della Rivia Manley and um, the publication of um, her um, New Atalantis and other works for which she was prosecuted. She was a um, uh, another agent of Harley. Uh, Robert Harley had a little um, stable of political writers, Defoe and Swift are those who are perhaps most famous now, but there are other others prominent in that as well, including John Arbuthnot, who produced the John Bull pamphlet. You know, that's that's something else. You know, John Bull, that figure, that famous figure, representative of the kind of the bluff, hearty Englishman, originated in a, in a pamphlet. Um, and also Matthew Pryor, a, a, an incredibly famous poet until recently, and um, also um, an important politician and diplomat. Um, so the short answer is yes, plenty of female involvement as authors patrons, publishers, readers to an extent. I had no idea about that and that's something I think I'd like to look into a bit more because the, the fact that women are so involved in all yeah. levels is... Another, another, good, another good book on that front is um, Paula McDowell's, um, I'll get the title slightly wrong, but I think it's called Women of Grub Street. Um, that covers 1675 to 1725 or so, so that's, that's, that's important as well. I love the title just by itself, so yeah. <laughs> definitely see if I can get that in the library. Um, oh, we have a lovely comment. Imagine if Defoe was alive now and had access to Facebook. So that's quite an interesting thought. Um, oh, we've got some thank yous and then we've got a couple more questions. Uh, someone would like to ask what key areas or topics in the collection have yet to be mined in your view? And how far do we think the most popular pamphlets reach the illiterate in rural areas, which I suppose you have kind of touched on a little bit? Yeah, to an extent. I think um, on the first question, um, the only sort of dedicated study of the pamphlets is an article on um, the prevalence of non-juring material because um, Baudelaire was a non-juror, which is to say that um, he didn't accept the um, the um, 
the the jure right of um william um and mary in 1689 even even if he accepted it de facto so it's it's kind of a bit sort of between jacobitism and um and, and loyalism um so so the, there is a study of the non-juring um features of the collection i i found i by no means opened every um volume of this collection but i opened quite a few and i found that sometimes they were quite um logically arranged by topic so a bit of a confluence of, of ones of medical ones um surrounding um a particular issue it's the first one i opened i think actually um which was the the return of, of plague to um europe or to france in 1720 so there was an outbreak of plague at marseille um in 1720 and this produced a, a wave of um pamphlets in um england on medicine how do you prevent the plague what is the plague where does it come from on religion is it a religious thing is it a judgment from god those sorts of questions on public health what are the right policies to adopt in these circumstances back in the 1660s when there was a big plague um the done thing was shutting up houses um walpole's government wanted to pass a quarantine act um it was controversial how do you manage um a pestilence you know Cops up again and again, doesn't it, through time? Um, so, so, so some volumes have, have a kind of um, a topical coherence. Some are linked by what you might call, um, well, just chronology, really, you know, a, a, a range of ones that seem to kind of follow each other in succession. Um, some, some are real hodgepodge, some, some, some are quite random. I think that, um, I, I, I think there's some good untapped material on particular figures. So, um, um, if people know the name John Tutchin, John Tutchin was a um, an interesting author. He he most famously wrote a, a periodical called um, The Observator until 1707, when he was beaten to death in the street by people who didn't like what he wrote. Um, he'd also been um, a Monmouth rebel who had been punished for that, and he tussled end endlessly with Defoe, surprisingly in some ways because they were both broadly speaking Whiggish. Um, but there are there are some. Um, printed items on touching that can't be found anywhere else um which include um i think one of him um yeah yeah the one of him being tossed in a blanket which is kind of funny until you realize what actually happened to him a few years later and especially you know seeing keir starmer harassed in the street and politicians being um assassinated in the last couple of years in in the uk is kind of you know brings it home um that's a bit of a, a rambling answer to a basic question which I'm I'm sorry, but yeah, there are there are there is some I, I should have mentioned as well. Um, there is some manuscript material in there, um, versions of things that were published and versions that I can't find published um, examples of, which which implies that they might be unpublished. So that that deserves to be studied, of course. So you know, you might flick through um, a, a volume and think, oh, these are, these are pamphlets that I could have got online, and then find some interesting manuscript material in there, mm -hmm. annotations or um, original compositions. That's fantastic and I always get very excited at the thought that there is untapped material in there for people there to is, yeah, come and is. look at and just to be able to say to people no <laughs> one's looked at this look you can be the first it's really really exciting. Yeah so some of the pages are uncut as well so some of these things have never been written I was there's, there's an item in there that um, as far as I can tell isn't available anywhere else in the world and um, the pages are uncut so you probably saw me I was sort of trying to open it up to photograph it um, I think I got it all. Excellent. So hopefully we will have a few visits from people who can really make use of this collection and get it out there following in your footsteps, which is fantastic. Um, so I think there's about two more questions. This one I missed just before. Uh, someone has asked they're interested in the um, economics of the pamphlets about how much they cost, how affordable they were, so how accessible and how did the money reach the authors, especially when they'd been published anonymously? That's really interesting. Or were they uh, distributed free of charge, in which case, how were they financed? So I think there's some really good questions there. Yeah, yeah. So a, a few things in there. And I realise I didn't answer the question about the, the reach into rural locations, but this might go some way to it. So, um, how are authors paid? Normally a one-off payment, straightforward. Um, we have a bit of record of, of Defoe. When Defoe got into trouble in 1713, um, what the government 
did normally was to um, bash down the door of, of whoever printed the thing and um, start to interrogate um, all the people who work in, in the place. You know, who's the author? Who'd you get the manuscript from? And they took they took all the stuff. And ideally, in this case, they found um, copies of it in Defoe's handwriting. Um, and the um, people arrested um, testified um, to the Secretary, Secretary of State, who was responsible for um, prosecuting all this, that um, Defoe was paid a standard rate. I wish I could remember the exact amounts, but it was it's basically a payment by the sheet. And it, so, so a sheet is um, not normally two sheets going to a pamphlet, you know, if it's, um, uh, you know, um, how many pages it is, but but depending on whether it's quarter or octavo, but normally a couple of sheets or single, sometimes a single sheet or a half sheet. And so they're paid by um, how, by, by the length of the thing. And sometimes also given um, copies. Um, it seems that Defoe, they at least say that um, um, his practice was to send um, his own, his kind of author copies um, for sale into provincial locations. He had contacts in, especially Newcastle and Norwich. So that seems to be what he did with his. Um, so that's how money reached the author. It'd be very untypical to, um, you know, be, be paid for reissues in the way that um, later authors are paid for reissues of, of literary works and the like. Um, it's normally alienation of property at the point of um, production. Then in terms of um, cost, well, it's very variable, but anything, well, you know, you have um, two penny pamphlets, you have you have six um, pence pa pamphlets, they're the most typical ones, and therefore they are quite affordable, um, by and large. Um, you know, relatively, you've got to remember that this, this is a very, very much a pyramid society in which lots and lots and lots and lots of people have no access to um, to culture, to, to printed books or other kinds of entertainment apart from popular street culture of various sorts. But that that also, there are all kinds of ways in which um, certain pamphlets become, I don't know, known, very, very well known. Sometimes they're summarised in newspapers or reported on in certain ways. Um, newspapers by and large being more more affordable um, and having a bigger reach, um, such that that they become that their arguments become very well known. You know, the, the conduct of the Allies um, sold in vast numbers. It just it captured the mood, and um, you know its arguments were probably known from um, from the you know one end of the country to another. Um, there were more questions in there, weren't there? Uh, do you uh, what the questions? Let me just go back to that one so um yeah you've talked about the affordability and how the money rich the authors i think yeah no i think you've answered oh the financing thing as well it should be said that um for so, some some writers are being financed by the ministry or by um the party so um harley instigates this in some respects and if people want to find out more then the great book on it is um alan downey's robert harley in the press which um talks about harley's very intelligent use of, of propagandists like Swift and Defoe. Um, in some respects, Harley, you know, he recruited Defoe out of prison, really. A guy who'd been writing against the government, he turned him into a, um, a loyal government writer. Um, and then he recognised that Swift wasn't just, you know, half decent at writing poetry and stuff, but also could write brilliant um, government pieces. So Harley was the first one really to, to get it, to understand this. In the later stages of Anne's reigns, um, the Whigs got it as well, and they started to organise something like a propaganda machine. Um, so we're not just talking about political parties with different views of, of government, of, of religion and the like, but we're also talking about rival kind of, you know, uh, publications. To give one example, Defoe sets up a periodical called Mercator to argue for the resumption of trade with France, and the Whigs set up uh, one called the British Merchant to argue the exact opposite. And so they're not just they, they, they are just kind of you know throwing stones at each other but they're also debating um free trade and the benefits of free trade versus protectionism um so quite um high level economic debates are being hammered out in in you know quite ephemeral topical publications okay. sorry you were going to come in and say something else then that, that's that's great. I think. I mean, I think you've answered the question and actually given us some extra information as well for that one. So that's. I just love the idea of people being so involved and people having that awareness. And you know, these topics we're talking about, they do sound so familiar to us today, as well. So 
it's fascinating. Now, I think we've got one more. Right, this one's quite a long one. So uh, let me see. Ah, oh, this is something we, we spoke about when you were with us the other week about the whether there's a technical definition of pamphlet or tract. So, for example, when is a track too long to be a pamphlet? And then uh, the question goes on to say, when does something that uh, that is ephemeral become enduring? So is that the doing of contemporary readers or people who keep that material and it almost accidentally survives or deliberately survives? And then we have got another sub question, but I let you do those. <laughs> those no, no, you, can, you can lay it all out if you like. Um... OK, um, just as an aside, uh, Bowdler has always been mocked by Shakespeareans for being the ultimate uptight proto-Victorian fuddy-duddy, but does his interest in sometimes salacious pamphlets work to complicate his stiff reputation? That's a good question. Well, I can probably answer the, the last part of that really, really quickly with I don't know. Um, but I, I don't, I, I, I'm not a biographer of the Bowdlers by any way, shape or form. Um, my impression is that obviously he, he the Shakespeare Bowdler, inherited all of this stuff, but don't think he added as much to it as his predecessors. Um, so how interested he was in it, I'm not really sure. So I, I'm not sure about that. Um, going back to the um, earlier question, or just remind me, Sean, I'm just having a mental blank. Just give me That's a kind of quick. It's all right. Um, da, da, it's, it's about the technical definition of pamphlet. Yeah. What's a pamphlet? Um, What's a tract? Which so we did speak about. So it's yeah, really absolutely. Well, they're they're they're, they're both arguably in some respects terms of opprobrium, um, pejorative terms in this period, and they come with them with different valences. I think um, I, I might say, to generalise, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure this can be disproven quite easily, but a tract probably implies prose. I don't think it exclusively implies religion, but I think tracts, you know, there's a kind of, there's a sense in which they're probably a bit longer, as the question um, hinted towards. Um, a tract is probably certainly something um, with a strong argument and sometimes pamphlets um, belie their arguments with titles like brief observations on or, um, you know, a short account of and those sorts of things purporting to be much more, you know, neutral and report, um, you know, giving reportage rather than a strident um, position on things. Um, but yeah, I don't think there is um, a really, um, I'd be glad to know if, other, if others have a sense of this, but to some degree there, there might be near enough synonyms in this period that um, it's difficult really to to make the distinction. You can tell that I, I'm much more comfortable with the term pamphlet because um, it doesn't come with, with, with it, it's much more um, accommodating. I think it's more inclusive. Um, I would talk about some of Defoe's tracts, including quite long books, and that seems to preclude pamphlets. I, th I think that anything under approximately 100 pages can be comfortably called a pamphlet, but, you know, rule of thumb. Um, yeah, sorry, another waffly, um, non-specific answer. Um, no, no. Make, make your own mind up. <laughs> no, that's absolutely great. I mean, I think I agree. I prefer pamphlet because I think it does sound a bit more exciting. And, <laughs> and I think people might just think tract religious and think it's quite narrow to that topic rather than pamphlets are just yeah. including everything so um yeah i'm going to try and remind myself to say pamphlets and tracts yeah like, yeah I, sh I should have thought about the um the etymology of this a bit more but i assume that let is obviously a diminutive isn't it so pamphlet is something i'm not i'm not sure i need to think more about that but mm, whereas tract you know tractatus and so on um yeah a bit more weighty and um, intellectual. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's the yeah. feeling I, I get from those terms. Yeah. Um, well, I think I've got through all the questions. I hope so. If I've missed any apologies, uh, if anyone does have any questions, um, once they've had a chance to, to think about the talk or if they have a watch your talk again on repeat, then, uh, you know, please do contact us or I'm sure that, you know, you can be contacted directly via Keel. Absolutely. Um, if we can find you. So I'll, I'll just say 
quite sadly, I think it's time to wrap up for this evening. So thank you to everyone for coming. And those of you who are viewing the recording, thank you for watching. But most of all, uh, many thanks once again to our fantastic speaker for such a really informative and a really, really entertaining evening. Uh, I can see lots of uh, comments in chats just saying thank you, applause. And it's a, a shame. I think the problem with having virtual events rather than real events is that we can't give you a round of applause, but I'm sure that people are doing that in their living rooms or wherever they are watching this from. So thank you very much. And I will say good night, Nostar, to everyone. Thanks so much. Good night.